It's the one place on Earth I never thought I'd be visiting. But I've been given the chance of a lifetime, an opportunity to travel with a group of scientists all the way to the one continent that remains elusive, the southernmost continent of the world, Antarctica. I don't know much about it, other than it's very cold and very far away, so getting there is no easy task. I'm getting on a flight here in Istanbul. We're heading to Brazil and then Chile. We're traveling one of the least traveled places on Earth. There will be freezing, glaciers and dangerous travel paths. We'll be gone for five weeks. We'll be following one of the most renowned scientists from Turkey as they conduct their research in the region. It's going to be the longest journey I've ever taken. We'll be making four stops before our final flight to Antarctica. It's clear to see why Antarctica is a magnetic attraction for explorers. It's the highest, driest, windiest, coldest and iciest continent on Earth. Most of the continent is covered by ice. In fact, Antarctica contains 90% of all the ice on Earth. It comes as no surprise that the coldest temperature ever recorded on our planet was here, lower than minus 89 degrees Celsius measured in 1983. What I've learned about Antarctica so far is intriguing. The continent isn't governed, but a treaty establishing some international rules was signed back in 1959. This was primarily to prevent any military action from taking place there. But seven countries have claimed territory in Antarctic and have had a scientific basis there for a long time. Amongst them are Chile, France, Norway and the United Kingdom. Even though the treaty allows the use of military personnel in the continent, the first article of the treaty states that Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. We've been flying around 20 hours on and off the planes, and this is our second stop, Santiago, Chile. We have two more stops, Punto Arenas and Porto Williams, right before to our final flight to Antarctica. Exhaustion is creeping in. Traveling has become grueling rather than enjoyable. Check-ins and transfers follow each other, but we have to keep traveling south with bags, luggage and gear for 24 people. After our last transfer in Punta Arenas, we are finally welcomed by the stunning nature of Patagonia. We are here in Porta Williams, and this is actually the southernmost city in the world. The scientists are currently receiving the last bit of training, getting them mentally and physically ready for the challenge ahead. And we'll soon leave the last leg of this long trip on our way to the final destination, which of course will be Antarctica. With all the briefings and training done, we wrap up for the last all-important flight to Antarctica. We just arrived in our first stop in Antarctica called King George Island. There are approximately 10 scientific bases here. Now we're going to be transferred to our boat from the other side of the island. To say that the weather here is extreme is an understatement. Antarctica generates the world's strongest winds. They are called katabatic, formed by cold, dense air flowing out from the polar plateau. It's at the steep edge of Antarctica that the strong katabatic winds form as cold air rushes over the landmass. It's the coldest, windiest weather I've ever experienced and makes traveling around here, by whatever means, more difficult. Ship bound, we make our way with Zodiac boats. When we eventually arrive at the ship, a fire drill welcomes us. It's a drill, but the message is clear. Stay alert, be prepared for anything. Things are unpredictable 
and circumstances can change with a simple gust of wind. As part of our journey, we have to make few visits before embarking on another three day long voyage. As we're heading to Antarctica's Horseshoe Island, which is hosting a Turkish scientific research camp. We are now on our way to visit international scientists at their permanent bases. There are dozens of stations here in Antarctica. The cooperation between different countries is uniquely peaceful. Argentina and South Korea opened their doors to us, and you can immediately feel a real sense of international cohesiveness. Everyone is working together here in the name of science. Burcu Ösoy is the scientist leading the Turkish Antarctic expeditions. She's been working on Antarctica for over 15 years and is well aware of the challenges of conducting an entire expedition from the ship. She says everything is depending on rapidly changing weather here. We usually start the day with plan A and I remember one day we had the plan Z and still <laughs> we couldn't really <laughs> conduct whatever we wanted to do. So therefore patience is quite important. She also tells me even if the circumstances may seem impossible, it is extremely important for scientists to come and study the huge white continent. This is a unique environment. And actually, I can simply say that Antarctica provides you what has been done in terms of climate change and, and other specific disciplines. What was it in the past? As we continue our journey, I'm astounded by the ice around Antarctica's coastline. It's so cold here that the seawater actually freezes to form these huge icebergs. 75% of Antarctica's coast is also surrounded by ice shelves, but unlike the icebergs, they are firmly attached to the land. They cover more than almost 1600 million kilometers squared. That's roughly the size of Greenland. You would think conditions here are too extreme for anything to survive. But still, some animals have managed to fight the harsh and rough climate. And you will find a rich and lively wildlife here, almost all of them depending on the sea. Like these curious friends wandering around our ship. These are the crab eater seals. They're mainly warm-blooded creatures and tend to be big enough to fend off the extreme and relentless cold. Our next challenge is to cross the 60th parallel south. It's a circle of latitude that is 60 degrees south of the Earth's equatorial plane. It crosses nothing but ocean. When you're at this latitude, the sun is visible for nearly 19 hours a day during summer, but only six hours during the winter. Even for the select few who do come to Antarctica, not many actually get to cross this important landmark. So we feel pretty lucky and privileged. Not so lucky are the crew members who are taking part in a strange game called King Neptune. It involves one person dressing up as the Roman god of the sea and punishing people for disturbing him by crossing the 60th parallel. Strange haircuts or a cold splash of Antarctic water are handed out as sentences. Well, I'm pleased to say it, I didn't take part in the game. Our next stop, the Faroe Islands, where the scientists have an important task ahead of them, as they'll be installing the very first global navigation and satellite system on the islands. Sonar is a scientist from the Turkish General Directorate of Mapping and the leader of this project. He says there are currently over a hundred GNSS stations operated by different countries throughout the continent. This is historic moment for Turkey as this is the first global navigation satellite system Turkey is building in Antarctica's Faroe Islands. This will help monitor climate change throughout the year and it will generate energy from the solar panels that are built on it. This is a positioning system. It finds the position, the coordinates of a point on the Earth. If you collect the data always, 24 hours per day, 365 days per year, it's possible to detect the exact location of the same point every day. 
So it's also possible that uh, to detect whether this point is moving or not. Uh, and actually this is the uh, basic purpose for the tectonic purposes of the permanent GPS stations. From what I understand, the collection of tectonic data sheds light on the relation between climate change and how the Earth is responding to it. In other words, by measuring millimetric tectonic movements, the scientists are aiming to measure the effects of melting ice sheets at the Antarctic Peninsula. This seems of real significance to me, as just five days ago, Antarctica experienced a record high temperature of 18.3 degrees Celsius, just like a warm, comfortable temperature in a city, but in the world's coldest place. Sonar also points out that installing such a station on a remote offshore island is crucial for international scientific cooperation. So it will be very valuable a uh, data source for the international scientific community, not just for us. I'm sure that two or three years later, uh, all scientists, uh, geoscientists, will apply us uh, and demand us uh, to give our data to them, because this is a critical point. I envision a group of world scientists trying to solve the same puzzle or solving the mysteries and secrets of a frozen world. The mission has been completed here in two days, and it's finally time to head to our main destination, Horseshoe Island. The island is located within the Arctic Circle, so the temperature here can rapidly change between 2 to minus 10 degrees Celsius in less than 30 minutes. Steep icy hills and strong winds create such a dynamic environment on the island and we want to be extra cautious about the hidden fractures on the ice, which can be deadly. Although we are the seasonal visitors here, the island has an abundance of permanent residents, like this herd of Adelie penguins. They don't seem to be surprised to see us, as if they know that us, humans, will be back. It is our first day on Horseshoe Island. To mark the beginning of research season, we are attending a formal opening ceremony and raising the flag from nearly 9,000 miles away from Turkish soil. Turkey has its reasons. It's a country which is highly vulnerable to climate change and already facing unobserved warming trends and temperatures. Ersan, Ersan, Orkun. So as a response, Turkey has shifted gears on investing in climate change and looking for ways to sustain the environment. And one of the key places Turkish scientists can find out more is here, on this unique continent. Alarmingly, over the past 50 years, Antarctica has been one of the most rapidly warming parts of the planet. The warming of this continent means changes to the physical and living environment here. It also means ice is melting and sea levels are rising, as they have never done before. And. I caught a glimpse of the force of nature. It seems almost impossible for a plant to survive in Antarctica, but despite the odds, there is an abundance of plant-like species that grow on ice, frigid water, and even on rocks. It's called algae. To make sense of this incongruity, I meet up with Turgay, a biologist who's been working on microalgae biotechnology to explain. Because the environmental condition doesn't favor the uh, seed uh, plants to grow up, so you cannot find. But microalgae can grow everywhere if there is enough sunlight and uh, moisture. He says it's almost impossible for a scientist to see all kinds of microalgae species in a lifetime. There has been uh, more than 20,000 different microalgae species identified so far. And it has been assumed that there should be more than 80,000 different microalgae species around the globe. His project here is to gather information about the biodiversity of microalgae on the island and collect as many of them as he can, 
so he can study them for the next two years. What I'm focused on is to get as many species as I can or see. Uh, but Horseshoe Island gives me what I want. There has been several different types of microalgae. More, uh, I'm going to run uh, some uh, analysis to understand general biotechnological importance, potential of uh, microalgae that isolate from here, from Horseshoe Island. He also says that these species via biotechnology have been adapted for human needs for many, many years. Organisms that are uh, adapted to live this kind of environments, they do develop different metabolic activities to handle the changing environmental conditions over here. So uh, if you understand the importance of the metabolites that they do produce to uh, fulfill their needs, then uh, you can use that metabolite for human consumption. So biotechnology is a way of methods to provide human need. So microalgae are also used uh, as a source to produce uh, drug, feedstocks or uh, food additives. But how did plants even get to Antarctica in the first place? And how does science continually lead us here? More than 60 years ago, a Turkish philosopher, Ordinarius Professor Hilmi Ziya Ülken, uh, summarizes the importance of uh, scientific research in Antarctic region in his book called Aşk Ahlak, saying that more than 50% uh, of what we have has been produced by using the information provided by Antarctic research. Another day and another mix of rather unpredictability. We embrace the fierce winds and dark clouds. On the agenda for the scientists today is to finish the logistics for the second navigation system and start building it. And to get the best scientific data, scientists need to install one of the stations at the very top. But the geography of Horseshoe Island is a tricky one. With its two very high steep hills, human activity needs a little helping hand. Helicopter operations started after the scientists found the right location for the second global navigation satellite system that is planned to build on the Antarctica's Horseshoe Island. Now the helicopter is carrying the equipment needed. So we've established why Turkey built the first GNSS systems in Faroe Islands. But why are two more needed on Horseshoe Island? The executive scientist of the project says these new stations will be mainly observing the changes in the troposphere, melting ice on the shores and rising ocean water levels. But most importantly... The information is for all the work of all the work. For example, this is the map of the map. Burada yapılan mesela batometrik çalışmalarda konum bilgisinin sağlanması bizim istasyonlarımız tarafından yapılabilir. Örneğin sismik çalışmalar, örneğin tektonik çalışmalar, örneğin adanın haritasının yapılması, topografyasının ortaya konması gibi çeşitli bilimsel alanlarda çok büyük katkılar sunabilir. Meet Hakan Yavaşoğlu, one of the leading scientists responsible for overseeing all 15 expedition projects. He highlighted how pivotal it is for all the projects to be interpreted collectively. Şu an 15 tane projemiz var. Bu 15 projenin içinde canlı bilimleri var, fiziki ve yer bilimleri var. Ayrıca sosyal bilimler var. Buradaki bilimler ayrı ayrı kendi bilimlerini çalışmakla birlikte esasında bir diğerine veri ve katkı sağlıyor. Bu çok önemli. Bu korelasyonu kurmazsak buradaki ekosistemi anlamakta zorlanabiliriz. Yani hem küresel iklim değişikliğinin ne sonuçları olduğunu görmeliyiz, canlıların buna karşı nasıl bir tepki verdiğini görmeliyiz, buna doğanın nasıl bir tepki verdiğini veya bununla birlikte nelerin değiştiğini gözlemlemeliyiz, görmeliyiz ve gelecek nesile aktarmalıyız. 
The turbulent weather makes its presence felt once more. But it's the sun's turn to make an appearance. Much to our delight, I'm on my way to join one of the youngest scientists on the expedition. Tuba is working on a project to get the seafloor map of the entire surroundings of the island. She takes us to an area where she'll be working during the day. A working day is never complete without an unexpected visitor. Like these crab eater seals, big, curious mammals trying to get to know their new neighbors. Üç boyutlu, yüksek çözünürlüklü hidrografik veriler, yani batimetrik veriler topluyoruz. Topladığımız bu derinlik verilerine çeşitli düzeltmeler yaparak e, ve çeşitli veri işlem aşamaları da uygulayarak deniz haritaları üretiyoruz. Bizim ürettiğimiz bu deniz haritaları sayesinde bölge civarında seyreden tüm deniz vasıtaları ve gemiler seyir emniyetlerini sağlamış oluyorlar. High resolution seafloor maps are important for ship navigation, geological research, habitat and ecosystem studies. Tuba is using a single beam sonar system, a combined transmitter and receiver called transducer, mounted on the side of her boat generating a single sound pulse. The pulse travels downward through the water, reflects off the ocean bottom and then returns to the surface where it's detected by the transducer. The ocean depth is calculated by knowing how fast sound travels in the water and measuring the time it takes the sound to travel to the bottom and back. This method of seafloor mapping she is using here is called eco-sounding. Ayrıca belli lokasyonlarda ve derinliklerde oceanografik gözlemler de yapıyoruz. Belli su özelliklerini ortaya çıkarıyoruz. Tuzluluk, iletkenlik, sıcaklık, ses hızı verileri gibi. Bu veriler sayesinde uzun vadede iklim değişikliği hakkında bilgiler ediniyoruz. Whilst it all appeared to be plain sailing, a sudden turn of events startled us. A chunk of ice breaks off from a huge floating ice mass. Right next to us, a testament to just how dangerous and precarious being out here can be. When I walk around the island, every corner and crevice feels distinctively special and needs both scientific and empirical attention. But this, this right here is absolutely my favorite. This hidden gem is called Galbe, located on the north of the island, right on the other side of where the Turkish research camp is based. Perhaps a point for exploration for the next expedition. The next morning, we are blessed with clear skies. We make plans to go on to the west side of the island to visit a historic site and meet the others at the camp. It's quite a walk to get there, but a fulfilling one as we are spoiled with wildlife. Turkey's scientific research camp is not the only one located on Antarctica's Horseshoe Island. This British scientific research station from the 50s called Base Y tells us so much about the life in Antarctica and how science was conducted back in the day. Being a natural freezer, everything here remains well preserved. Food stocks, fixtures, fittings, and even a signed poster of the Queen. Inside this historic station that was only used for five years, it feels like you're in a time capsule, a capsule of life, wonder and science in the Antarctic during the late 50s. We finish up on the historic side of the island, and as we head to meet the others at the research camp, we notice the wildlife responding to the atmospheric phenomena. Heavy snow abruptly hits the island, a joyous occasion for the animals. A little less so for us. So after an unexpected heavy snow, we received a message from the captain and he says there's a storm coming towards us and this means this could actually be our last night. The message is clear act fast or risk being stuck on the ship for a week. The last thing we want is to fall behind schedule and every second counts. With a successful expedition complete, time for some thrill. We are rewarded with a helicopter ride as we fly high and get to enjoy the splendor of this wilderness 
A rush of sadness runs through me. I never thought I would feel this way about leaving. I'm overwhelmed by the abundance of magical moments I've experienced during my trip. It's impossible not to be moved by the sheer beauty and power of this extraordinary, brutal continent. In a heart-stopping moment, it's time to say goodbye to this land that has left me feeling grateful and humbled. Antarctica, thank you.